thank you so much for coming out on a Saturday morning. I'm really honored, right, to see this very full audience. And thank you for coming out. Before we start, let me just get a sense of who's in the room. Uh, I don't want this to be like a broadcast. I want it to be a session where, you know, when you walk away from here in an hour, you say, okay, you know, it was worth it. It was worth not sort of getting up early, missing the breakfast, doing the commute, whatever. So let's get a sense of who's in the room. How many freelance designers, or uh, not even designers, just freelance creators, writers, whoa, okay. Okay, so that's the studios, people who work in studios. Okay. And then people who work in enterprises, just a few, okay. But I think that uh, today's talk is really focused on these three audiences. So I think that, you know, I'm glad that we seem to have covered the entire room. If we've left anyone out, please just, uh, when we get to the Q&A, ask me stuff about how to make this more relevant for you. So without further ado, okay. So I'm not gonna spend too much time on this. I mean, she's already said very kind things, but just to give you a perspective, this is my journey. I started um, in an IT services company. I then went on to become partner at a design studio. I was co-founder at a SaaS startup. This is a lesser known fact, but we actually built and exited uh, an early Slack. And now, as Amishi said, I've just launched, I mean, actually today is our third month anniversary. So we launched November 15th. And yeah, yeah, so yeah. So great to be here with you guys. I just realized it this morning, you know, I was getting up and I was scheduling some meetings and I was like, oh my God, it's November 15th. Uh, you know, it's exactly 90 days since we launched the hard copy. So very fitting that I'm here amongst all of you. And why did I launch the hard copy? I'm just going to take a minute to tell you about that. So, you know, after I exited the different businesses, the studio, the SaaS startup, uh, I spent a lot of time just talking to people, like almost 2015 to 2018, talking to the creator community in India. And I was amazed that there was still so much fragmentation. Uh, Mumbai people don't know what's happening in Bangalore, don't know what's happening in Gurgaon. Graphic designers don't know what's happening with digital experience designers. Uh, it's, it's enterprises live in their own world, studios live in their own world. It's just nobody talks to each other. And I think that because we don't do that, there's very little learning, right? There's very little, you're left to your own devices to learn. There isn't a one spot where you can go to figure out what's happening in this ecosystem. And we're at a very, very exciting point in our journeys in India. Uh, and I can tell you having been on a two decade long journey in this ecosystem, right? We are building things from the ground up in this country. And we are building things for our own audiences that we cannot derive from the West. And that makes this so important. It makes it even more important that we talk to each other, figure out what's happening and learn from each other. And I was just kind of pissed off actually that even after such a long time, you know, I kind of stepped out of the studio world. And when I started to go around 16, 17, talking to people, I was like, okay, so what's in your inbox? What are you guys reading? And it was still the same suspects, you know, fast company design, milk design, boom. I was like, but who's talking about what's happening in India? They were like, no one. I mean, you know, we just figure it out for ourselves. And I was like, okay, time for something. And of course, you know, I have been in my uh, angel investing career, an uh, investor in some publications. And I can tell you, it's a nightmare of a business, okay? It's horrible. It's, it's a publishing machine. Once you start, once you put your foot on that, you, you know, you take your foot off the brakes, you've got to publish to a cadence because your audience expects that to happen. Creating high quality content is very expensive. There are no ways to monetize. I mean, all my friends in the investing world gave me 30 reasons why I should not do this. They were like, why are you doing this? Why don't you just go back to your consulting career, right? I mean, you do a project, you get paid, then you go off to Goa for a month. I mean, what is wrong with you? Why are you starting this? I mean, it's going to be a nightmare. It's going to, you know, and I was like, okay, fine. We'll see where it goes. It's been 90 days since we launched. 
lots of highs lots of lows lots of you know uh, received a five page google doc with criticism <laughs> listing out all the things we were like doing wrong but that's great because we have received an avalanche of feedback and um, i hope i'll get some from all of you too but the reason i'm here is to share whatever i've learned on this journey right so i have this um, personal philosophy which is that unless i've experienced it i'm not going to talk to you about it or i'm not going to recommend it so i'm here today to really not uh, give you advice but to share what i've experienced and if it helps any of you in any way then this will have been so worth it okay so we will stick to the theme um chosen by creative mornings and we'll stick to invest and then this begs the question when you think about investing who or what should you be investing behind and th the answer seems fairly clear you know all of us want to invest time and resources in something that improves the quality of our lives right something that increases our happiness and what is that let's let's talk about what are the things that increase your happiness and based on my experience of course but really based on a ton of research and if you want you know after this we can share links based on a ton of research around the world it happiness comes down to two just two things anybody want to guess what they are very simple things anybody want to guess what your happiness quotient depends on or at least what the research says it depends on people absolutely right so number 1 all studies show that happy people have invested in relationships right no question about it what's number 2 Number 2 What kind of satisfaction? 100%. So this is a very smart audience. I can go home now. So that's it, right? Really not rocket science. People you love, work that you do. If you invest behind these two things, the chances are that you will be a happy person. Okay? So, uh Now I'm not going to presume I know it was Valentine's Day yesterday but I'm not going to presume to give you advice on love okay that's not what this session is about maybe over coffee later but let's focus on this right let's focus on this session on the work that you do and I get asked um this question about my work a lot right I get asked two questions a lot and I've been in meetings in Delhi in uh Mumbai and it's two questions that everyone asks me one okay how did you do what you did right what's the secret sauce what's behind the successes of the businesses that you grew and scaled and exited and number two if you look back on your journey what would you do differently and those are the two things people ask a lot and it's very interesting that the answer to both those things is actually the same and the answer to you know what why were we uh back in the early 2000s able to start a studio and scale it and exit it you know why were we able to do that when there were a lot of other studios at the same time that were not able to do it right and the answer to that is that we were we set out on a journey to be really much more aware of who we were what our strengths were what our clients were today in 5 years how the world around us was changing and i'll talk about that a little more and the thing that i would do differently when i look back is actually the same thing that no matter how much we felt we had uh, sort of become aware of the stuff around us it wasn't enough so if i had to do things differently i would say in hindsight there was so much stuff we should have known but we didn't we just didn't spend the time or the work to figure that out and i'll get to specifics later so this session is going to be about telling you that you need to be investing behind awareness and awareness of what <coughs> as you can see i like lists right i love numbered lists 
let's talk about just three things, right? I mean, there are more, but today, let's talk about only three things which are relevant to the audience in the room. Let's talk about how we're going to invest behind awareness of ourselves, how we're going to invest behind awareness of our clients, and how we're going to invest behind awareness of a changing world. And I think these three things if you put time, resources, energy behind these three things, the chances are high that you will, I mean, success is a difficult word to use, but let's just say that you will see the impact on your work life. Let's start with the first and most important. Now, you know, there are so many ways you can invest behind yourself, but I don't want to go into all of, you know, we don't have time to go into so many, so we're going to stick to, like I said, I like lists, six tips, right? So you take away six tips. And the first one, which is about yourself, is to be a T. Does anyone know what this means? Who knows what it is to be a T? You know of a lot about a lot, but you know about one thing more deeply. Absolutely. So I think today, the most important thing is, as you said, having a superpower, but then also having this ability to collaborate in related fields. <clears throat> and like I, you know, I said at the beginning of the talk, this is not just theory. Let me tell you a little story. So, uh, I'm not going to use dates because I'm sure I'll get them all wrong, but let's just say very early in my career, after my, I'd quit my first job at my IT services company, uh, I was freelancing like a lot of you in the room. And because I wasn't sure what I wanted to do, I was literally taking anything and everything that came my way. I'm sure a lot of you have had that experience, right? Where you just say, okay, I'm figuring this out on the way, but for now, let me just take everything. So along came a query from a friend and they said, listen, there's this brochure and uh, will you write the copy for it? I was like, oh, come on, but okay, fine. Let me just, you know, and it was like, it was a brochure for farm tractors. <laughs> so, I mean, not even like a glamorous brochure. So I was like, okay, chalo, let's just do it. Let's just take whatever comes. And so I started working on this, you know, scintillating copy for farm tractors. And um, I'd always, like I said, I'd always been um, interested in, you know, this is me really. So I've been a suit all my life, my core strength, oh sorry, my core strength is uh, strategy and marketing, but I've always been interested in design and technology, right? So when I was writing this brochure, I would go to, and this was actually you know, given to me by Rain Kishwan, the studio at which I later became partner, and I would go to the studio to talk to the designer who was designing the brochure, and I would sit there, we would discuss the specs of the whatever, so many horsepower tractor. And one day when I went there, they were discussing a pitch. So what had happened was that they had been asked to send in a proposal for a tech company, right? And they were discussing it, and I was eavesdropping shamelessly. And uh, they were discussing how to put it together. Back in the day, uh, it was a team of five, and there were only two Macs. So people had to like book slots and then take turns. Right? That's how studios were set up in those days. One printer. My God, to get something color printed. <sighs> so I was listening to this and like, you know, I'd sort of re been reading a lot on design and technology and I s interrupted them and I said, look, I'm really sorry, I'm eavesdropping. You don't know me. I'm the freelance copywriter. But uh, I think that you're not looking at this the right way. And do you want to think about it X, Y, Z way? And that could have gone both ways, right? They could have told me to just like shut the fuck up and get out. Or it went the way it did, which is what happened. I mean, they stopped and they said, sit down and you know, tell us more. And I think that the, that first exam was about them because they were all fabulous designers, uh, really testing my, they didn't want to take advice or whatever, even input from anybody who didn't, who was, just didn't understand design at all. So that was my first test, right? I wasn't a designer, but my first test, my first t-test was, did I even understand what this proposal was going to be about? And I did. We went on to, I went on to work on the pitch. 
we went on to win the pitch. And then a year later, you know, Sujata Keshwan, who'd founded the studio, walked down and said, you know, you're supposed to be freelance, but you're here every morning. So, I mean, it's a bit silly. You know, you have your own coffee mug. So, you know, I, you, either we just pay you a salary or, you know, if you want to think about other stuff and that's, that's a different story, let's talk about it. And I was like, okay, let's talk about it. So, I think that being that T really defined the trajectory of my career. So, I encourage you all, think about it. What's your superpower? And what's your tea, right? Tip number one. The second thing. Find somebody or something that helps you see what you can be. This is a very difficult thing and it's got to be an external party. None of us, or at least, you know, I was not, um, even companies are not equipped to really see themselves what is their full potential. It's very difficult because we're caught up in the day-to-day, -day. we're caught up in the running of our operations. Very hard, no matter how much you brainstorm and workshop, to see what you could grow up to be. So find yourselves a magnifier and this could be a person, this could be a company, this could be anybody. What's my story about a magnifier. It's not a happy story, okay? Uh, you know, I would be doing you guys a grave injustice if I just came here and told you, like, you know, anecdotes of triumph. Uh, so, I don't know how many of you know, but Ray and Keshavan had an extremely successful run. We built... It was fantastic that our growth coincided with really India post-liberalization. So, we built mega brands, Airtel, Kotak, all the airports, many. And then we started to hear that the global, until then there had been no global branding studios in India. There were only the ad agencies, right? They were our only competition. <coughs> and there were a few, of course there were smaller Indian studios, but we had scaled way beyond, like we had become big. So when there were big pitches, literally we would walk into the room and you know, without sounding arrogant, it was just that our scale was so much that the clients felt that, hey, we have to give it to them because the other studios are too small. They're not going to be able to handle, like, roll out in 22 states, roll out in 16 languages, give it to RNK, they can do it. So we reached this kind of monopoly situation almost when it came to big projects. And then we heard that the global studios were coming to India. So, so far what they had done was they were set up in Hong Kong or Singapore or Dubai. If there was a pitch, they would fly people down. And that would put clients off, you know, because, I mean, some people like it, but a lot of clients, you know, they, they get smart and they said, listen, you know, the costs are high, then they won't be here for the rollout. So, you know, that was competition to us, but not, it wasn't fierce. And then we heard that, hey, come on, the, everyone's very smart. They figured out India's growing. They're going to come here and they're going to set up in the country, in Mumbai or Delhi or Bangalore, and they're going to service clients out of here. Now, that was a huge threat. And I think that we didn't have a good enough magnifier. And we got scared. And what did we get scared about? Not so much losing clients, because, you know, studios, no matter how much you scale, I mean, at our peak, we were 50 people, 50, 55 people. You're never going to be 5,000 people. So there would always be enough work in India for 50 people. But what we were scared about was that we would lose people. We said, listen, if the global giants come in and they offer our teams, you know, now you go work in Paris, now you go work in Brazil, now you, we're not going to be able to keep the best talent in the country. We can't match those pay skills. And therefore, we will become a shadow of ourselves. And therefore, we should sell. And that was our strategy. And in hindsight, I mean, you know, it's hard to say, was it right or was it wrong? It was too early. We should have hung in there. We should have had somebody who told us, you're thinking about this all wrong. You can be bigger than all the global studios. You just stick to what you're doing. It's working. You don't have to be scared. But we didn't have that magnifier. We did, in hindsight, uh, you know, exit too early. Should have hung in five more years and made 5x more. So, you know, find that person 
who will show a mirror to you and say, don't panic. This is who you are today, but this is who you could be. Okay, so that's about you. Just two tips, easy to remember. Let's talk about your clients. Oh my God. <sighs> so, this is a question we get asked a lot, right? Again, how did you, and I, I was just telling Amishi that I've been on this Bharat Yatra meeting studios, right? Really asking them what you want to see in the hard copy, what can we do for you? And this is a question that comes up. How did you deal with clients? Because, you know, the bigger a project gets, the more complex it gets. How do you still, at scale, make sure that high quality work comes out at the end of the day? It's not lost amongst the bureaucratic layers and the, you know, the agreements that have to come from top down and all of those things. And this is something I want you all to take a minute to think about. Okay. Because it's very easy to blame clients. It's very easy to say, they don't know, they don't get it, they don't get good design or good strategy or good writing or good branding. And you know, they're just screwing up our work and they're saying make the logo bigger, which I don't think happens anymore, but you know, you know what I mean, right? But the truth is, how many of us as a community have stepped back to say we're taking responsibility here? We're just not trying to push our work through. We're actually taking responsibility for the outcome of this project. And here's my story number three. Uh, so sad I can't name names because it would make it clearer. But cello, you know, large FMCG major. Let's just say largest in the country. Okay, so, <laughs> right. Uh, and if any of you have worked for large organizations, you will know that it's hard as hell, right? First you'll have one layer, then another layer. We've actually had brand managers telling us, I think I like this, but I'm going to confirm for sure whether I like it or not after my boss decides. <laughs> it's like, okay, you went to IMM, the bath for what? But anyway, so, um, you know, that's, so there was this project, not one, but many projects with this large company. And it was a fight, right? And uh, we stepped back and said, okay, let's just think about this. This is, we're not making headway here. How do we do this? How do we ensure that we're still taking on this mega project? And we are still ensuring that good quality comes out at the end. And so we proposed to them a very novel structure. We said, we will take responsibility for, you know, this is our cost. You pay us this much. If sales go up or whatever, whatever the parameters were, if they go up, you pay us this much. And the point is not whether we got paid that X amount or didn't get paid. Because I would not recommend this structure to any of you, right? Because you will never get paid the X amount. <laughs> there are many ways to, you know, there's so much creative accounting that happens. So it's, but the point was that we, the client was so surprised because we were saying we're taking responsibility for this brand. Okay, we're committed to the same metrics that you are. And when you do that, when you take responsibility, your influence goes up greatly. You know, the equation changes. You're not then uh, someone who is just there to do the work, hand over, pick up your check and leave. You're there to say, we're committed to the same thing. We're part of the same team. We're taking responsibility. And when you do that, you will find that the, your influence with your client goes up hugely. Uh, and I have seen, even today, really, really seasoned creators, when they send a proposal in for, to a client, they start with a list of deliverables. I mean, how many of you send in a proposal where number pa page number one or page number two is your list of deliverables? One person only, okay. Okay, so you're going to change that, but yeah, great that none of you know the others don't. Fantastic. I still see it a lot. I mean, people are still uh, positioning themselves as a list of deliverables, and the minute you do that, you will never have influence because a list of deliverables is not responsibility. It is saying that hey, this is my work, and when I've checked off this list, I'm out of the door. And then the client is going to treat you that way, saying that okay. 
fine, this is just somebody who comes in, does the work and leaves, the responsibility is all still mine. You will never be able to go up the pricing ladder. You will always stay at a certain price and you will never be able to go up the influencer ladder. So think about how there's no formula. Each of you is working in different areas. Think about how you can take more responsibility and I guarantee that your influence with the client will increase. Step up. What happens is that when you get very good at something, right? When you get very good at, uh, it could be anything. You could be an illustrator and you get really good at that or your studio gets known for a certain, you know, uh, restaurant branding or you get more and more and work in this more work in the same area because you're very good at that right so then the word gets around in the industry you'll get more and more and more work in that same industry and you can do it easily your team can do it easily it comes naturally to you you will that's actually a trap while you should develop domain knowledge you need to break that boundary once a year at least so every year, do a step up project, which is totally out of your comfort zone, completely out of you don't know the industry. It's going to give you sleepless nights. It may fail, but it will help you grow like nothing. So story. Uh, it was the dot com boom, right? Uh, early 2000s. There was just so much money floating around and Everybody needed, you know, there, were, there was a dot com being born every morning and everybody needed a website. And I'm telling you, websites in those days were frightening things. They were built on flash and they used to swirl and, you know, load. <laughs> <laughs> and the sort of zanier your loading graphics were, the cooler you were, right? I mean, nobody luckily was asking about things like, you know, nasty things like performance and page loading and who gives a shit? Yeah, just make it look cool. And we were a graphic brand identity design studio, right? Our designers were all um, sort of coming out of disciplines like that. And we saw this happening around us. You know, I was talking about awareness of clients and, you know, we, we, we would hear people talk about this. We would hear people talk about this whole website thing. And so I sat down with my partner one day and I was like, you know, I think we should be doing this. I mean, I'm looking at it and it's not seeming like rocket science. And, you know, the team was like, yeah, but it needs technology. We don't get it. So we were like, I was like, let's, or we were like, because she was very much for the idea. I was like, let's hire the tech. So we actually did what seemed drastic to a lot of people. We went out. We were just then uh, 12, maybe 15 plus people. We went out and hired a six person tech team. And we just said, come in here. And we were paying them much more than all of us were earning. So it was because we were getting them from places like Infosys and Wipro and, you know, there were no other people then. And we were like, okay, let's do this. And I mean, it was fantastic while it lasted. We did websites for everybody, right? And we did even like, I mean, I'm thinking back for a very large IT client. We did sort of a second life of Tar back in the days. Of course, it never took off. And then came the dot com crash. And suddenly no one wanted websites anymore, right? And no one wanted to talk about anything that had a dot com at the end of it. And all the work that had come in dried up, like almost overnight, it was gone. And we were left with a six person, very highly trained, very uh, sort of expensive team. It was a tough call because all of you know when you work in small intimate teams, these guys are your friends, right? Your buddies, you're hanging out with them. You, it was a really tough call. And we said, look, the business is gone. We don't know when it's coming back. We know we can go back to brand identity. Uh, we can do all of that stuff and we'll be fine. But we don't know if there's any work for you guys and when it's ever going to come back because it was looking really dark. So we said, please start looking for other jobs. We have enough reserves to keep paying you salary cuts, they agreed to a salary cut, but we'll pay you till you find other jobs, right? But this is over. And it was a very, very tough call. And, you know, luckily it worked out. They got other jobs. They're all now doing very well. But it was a great step up for us, which in the classic sense of the word failed. But it taught us so much that we always retained that digital edge. And that finally, when it came to our valuation, finally, when it came to the exit, 
was such a force multiplier, right? So if you do step ups, don't measure them in terms of whether you were able to deliver that project, whether the client liked it, look at the long term outcome and just go do it. This is something that's, you know, it's self evident, everybody needs to keep up with what's happening, but too few people do. And today, particularly the way things are changing, it's frightening. Right. I mean, it's there's a new thing every morning and I have everywhere I go. There are these discussions about how much code should I know? Should I know how to code? Should I you know how much tech should I know? And I think that there is only really one answer that I can give you. There are no answers that apply to everybody. Do what you're doing right now. I mean, I don't know if this talk has been worth it or not, but do what you're doing right now and get out. So I've been very lucky to have a uh, two mentors, you know, one was a designer, one was an engineer. And every time I would ask them, okay, how do I enhance my design skills, my understanding of design? Or how do I enhance my understanding of technology? And both of them would give me the same answer. Yes, you can do a lot of reading on the internet. Yes, there are great resources. But the best way to learn is to just get out, go to events, go to talks, go to wherever five people are gathering, just go speak to people, listen to them. If you're not doing that, you can't keep up with what's happening in your world. So I know that there are too few events in India. Uh, and the few there are are extremely expensive. You know, hopefully, we're just seeing the start of a movement and that will change. But you know, set up your own neighborhood events or set up networks. So I, I don't know what it takes. But Try and get out and meet as diverse people as you can. I mean, once a year, go to an event that has nothing to do with you. Go to a tech event. I mean, maybe you attend only 5% of the talks, but you will come back with something that you did not know before. So that's in a very online world. That's my sort of contrarian advice. Be offline and meet people as much as you can. Right. And the last thing. There isn't a slide for it, but um, is that a lot of us as creators are shy. It's also a cultural Indian thing because I've worked with people around the world and it's a very Eastern thing, are shy to put ourselves out because we say, hey, our work should speak for itself. In an attention deficit world, that's just not true. Just not true, right? So you have to put yourself out and stop being diffident about it. What does putting yourself out mean, right? It means a, if I, okay, let's just say I picked five people in this room and I Googled you, what would I find? How many people say that I would find what you want me to find? Okay, that's, 5% of the room. What about the rest? So at least step number one, right? Get your work, what you do, your strengths, your point of view, get it out there where people can discover it. And please don't be diffident about plugging it every chance that you get. You know, you have nothing to be shy about. This is work that you should be proud of. So. Talk about it, present it wherever you can. And in that vein, this is my last slide. <laughs> Shameless plug. Please go read the hard copy. Send me feedback because, you know, it is for people like you. So happy investing. Thank you. <laughs>